I wanted to spend a few moments this morning to discuss with you kind of the updates on the management of spinal epidural abscesses. Despite the fact that the, and just to disclose, I am a consultant for Stryker, but that has no bearing on this talk. Historically, the diagnosis of spinal epidural abscesses was initially made over 250 plus years ago by Morgagni in a post-mortem autopsy. The subsequent surgery of a thoracic decompression by Barth in 1901, followed by a seminal article by Husner in 1948 historically. The incidence continues to rise of this entity, and despite that fact, the mortality also continues to rise with about approximately 5 to 20 percent in modern series. The reason for the increase in incidence could be associated to the prevalence of our patient population as an aging population uh, and the awareness of our primary staff in assessing these patients and the sensitivity of imaging studies, obviously the MRI with gadolinium to assess the uh, presence of this disease entity. Risk factors have been discussed ad nauseum, and there's multiple studies that show uh, the various risk factors, and understanding those risk factors helps us in understanding the management of these patients, and you'll see that as we go through this discussion. Diabetes, obviously, the increase in IV drug abuse in our patient population, uh, immunodeficiency, uh, hepatic and renal disease, and that's been discussed in multiple studies as to uh, the relative risk factors associated with this disease entity. Understanding the pathophysiology of this disease process helps to give us guidance in the management of these patients. Hematogenous spread, uh, direct extension from psoas abscesses or uh, vertebral body, vertebral osteo. And then inoculation from spinal procedures, of which we all know. Some studies that were done by Feldeser, Feld, Feldenzer uh, discussing the rabbit model and showing uh, direct inoculation with decompression goes towards the idea that a direct decompression and the pathophysiology of direct uh, compression of the spinal cord. But there have been post-mortem autopsies that have shown the indirect component of this disease process, and essentially that there is a vascular component or a thrombophlebitis that can potentially cause uh, worsening complications. And this is why there's kind of this insidious nature uh, when it's related to uh, the decline of these patients neurologically. We all know the common pathogens, predominantly your MRSA, uh, MSSA, E. coli from urinary tract infections, pseudomonas from IV drug abuse. The diagnosis is had by the classic clinical triad but of back pain, fever, and neurologic manifestation, but that doesn't happen that frequently, and that's why understanding the risk factors and the lab tests that are continuously monitored, including CRP, ESR, CBC, and blood cultures, imaging studies, as well as uh, your MRI, which helps to further understand your diagnosis. This is taken from Mass General. Uh, Dr. Mannion uh, gave a relatively good uh, algorithm here for our understanding of the um, patients that should be under getting uh, MRIs. And uh, this is good for our physicians in the primary care setting. Um, the treatment, there's no real uh, controversy when it comes to that, right? Antibiotics for systemic disease. Surgery, laminectomy, the most common for decompression. <coughs> Anterior lateral approach for uh, deformity. Lesser invasive techniques, right? Your CT guided aspiration, uh, hemilaminectomies or interlaminar fenestration. Sorry. One of the initial studies or reviews by Rigamonti basically talked about the benefits of surgery uh, for all patients that had spinal epidural abscesses, all comers. And this is where some of the controversy lies now, right? Because of the fact that we can monitor these patients and because we are able to assess and we're more aware of this situation, there's more literature pointing towards medical management of these patients and not surgical. And that's what we kind of want to discuss. There's no controversy as it's related to surgery for acute or progressive neurologic decline, spinal deformity, uh, instability, or uh, disease burden. The only controversy is why I'm still up here talking about this. This is kind of a good <laughs> review uh, of, uh, the, from Dr. Tuckman's paper, and I believe he's here, uh, looking at some of the seminal studies uh, in regards to operative versus non-operative management. 
few of the studies that I referenced here uh, looked at the benefits of surgery, for example, with Connor's group, uh, that advanced age and preoperative weakness correlated with poorer outcome, and that they essentially recommended surgery and decompressive surgery despite the fact that there was really no statistical significance between the operative versus the non-operative management. Patel looked at a larger review of patients, and uh, early surgery was recommended in those patients because, again, it improved neurologic outcome, but there was a 41% failure rate from medical management to surgery. The important thing to note on this paper and the subsequent paper that I'll reference is the parameters that they found, again, which goes back to our risk factors, that were associated with medical failure of management of this disease process. That included diabetes, CRP over 115, white blood cell count, and bacteremia. They did note that those patients without these risk factors obviously did well with antibiotics alone. Dr. Arco and their group also looked at these risk factors, and again, it's kind of a running theme, right? Age over 65, MRSA infections, concurrent MRSA infections, CRP elevation and white blood cell count elevation, and obviously neurologic decline. Dr. Kim, who's present here today, uh, also has a wonderful paper and referenced here that looked at a significant group of patients and a lot of them that were treated uh, non-operatively. And what they found was, again, MRSA, age over 65, diabetes, and neurologic impairment were associated with decline. And in fact, they showed that these risk factors and independent predictors of having one risk factor uh, was approximately a 30% failure rate and exponentially increasing to about a 90% failure rate of medical management alone with having four, all four risk factors. So it's important to note and understand that when you have patients like this, that you have a clinical suspicion of spinal epidural abscess, and if they have concurrent MRSA, age over 65 or diabetic, that these potentially patients can decline rapidly and potentially need surgical intervention, or they should be put down your algorithm towards surgery alone. Another study by Adagwa looked at patients over 50 and the benefits of surgery. They didn't really find significant, or they did not recommend uh, significant improvement versus surgery versus IV antibiotics alone. But it's important to note what they commented on this age group, again, with this uh, elevated age group, was that these patients that are older, they felt uh, the clinical decline associated with the disease process the morbidity associated with surgery was worse than the benefit that would be as, uh, aided from surgery itself. And then obviously, Dr. Tuckman's paper, which references the use of IV antibiotics alone versus surgery, and they really did a good job of showing that IV antibiotics were beneficial in those patients who were unable to undergo surgery, whether it was due to morbidity, uh, complete neurologic injury that was over 48 hours, or those patients that were neurologically intact. And that surgery, what they did find in timing of surgery was that those patients that were going down the, par the paradigm for surgery benefited from surgery earlier rather than later. And this was, again, discussed in Gobriel's paper as far as timing uh, early surgery beneficial within 24 hours uh, than with patients who had a neurologic deficit. There's a few different algorithms I posted here that you can take a look at, one in, from ARCO and then one from Dr. Tuckman that really do a good job, and I won't go through them significantly, but essentially go back to that idea of understanding your risk factors, right? Patients that are over 65, concurrent MRSA infections, understanding that elevations in CRP and white blood cell count, that will help you in uh, aiding in whether or not these patients go down the surgical plan or the medical management plan. So there is still some controversy, and I think because of our awareness of this disease entity uh, and our ability to gain uh, understanding of it sooner rather than later, we're able to manage these patients medically, and we're not having to take them to surgery urgently. Obviously, there's no argument that if a patient is declining neurologically, you need to decompress them. But I think there are patients that can be treated medically without having the necessity for surgery. It is important to note that close observation in these patients that you do feel could potentially go down the necessity for surgery, because there is approximately a 15% failure rate uh, in modern series as far as uh, medical management alone. 
And if surgery is decided, then obviously doing that sooner rather than later. There are studies that look at under 24 hours versus up to three days out when deciding for surgery, and I think Dr. Tuckman really comments on that on his paper, that essentially if you're deciding to do surgery within 24 hours is the best time to do so for better neurologic outcome. Thank you.